This is going to be a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Revelation. The book has 22 chapters and 404 verses, and it is written by the Apostle John. If you notice, it says, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. John is a diviner and shows in the book of Revelation that he has the ability to tell the future. He gets this ability from God, who reveals many things to him in this book. The devil's counterfeit for this would be psychics, fortune tellers, and things like that. If a person picked up the Bible and started reading Revelation and believed it, they would have many things revealed to them. And we are going to go verse by verse. And I want to start out in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 1. And this is going to be called Revelations while reading Revelation. In Revelation 1.3 it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Blessed is he that readeth. You're blessed just for reading the book of Revelation, but only if you keep those things which are written therein. Atheists and God-haters who go to the book of Revelation with the wrong motive will not get a blessing. They will probably get a curse when they are in hell. They will regret reading the book of Revelation. They will hate all of the knowledge they have compiled about God's book when they're burning in hell. So Christians, if you want a blessing, read God's book. Many people will say they aren't a reader and reading is become a thing of the past to a lot of people. But if you read the Gospels, Jesus Christ was always saying the phrase, have you not read? Over and over he would say, have you not read? Many of you have read, but you have read magazines like Sports Illustrated, Soap Operas Digest, you've read Harry Potter, Fifty Shades of Grey, and a bunch of other filth that fills your heart with things that will eventually come out of your mouth. But Isaiah 34 and verse 16 says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read you have access to the Word of God 24 7 why won't you read it and 1st Timothy 4 13 says till I come give attendance to reading to exhortation to doctrine so read God's book and if you do read then you will have some things revealed to you so let's start in Revelation 1 and verse 1 it says the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. This brings us to our first point. John reveals to us that something is coming to pass. Many have gave up hope that anything is going to come to pass, and they think that the Bible is just a fairy tale. If you have faith to believe this book, then you believe the verse which says, must shortly come to pass. Even though you see all of these videos about the end of the world that say something strange is happening or something is coming in 2017 or the end is in 2017 or September 23rd, the end of the world. And people do these things to get attention. They make all these videos about the end of the world. And after you've seen about a hundred of these things, you start thinking, is something really going to come to pass? This just produces a lot of doubt, especially in unsaved people. Second Peter 3, verses 3 through 4 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? After people see so many of these videos, like the Jason A videos, they begin to say, Is He really coming? Or... After someone like Harold Camping lies about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, many will lose faith. But you can have comfort that the Bible says, shortly come to pass. John wrote this 2,000 years ago, so to say shortly come to pass seems a bit odd. But it isn't. You need to remember that in the book of Revelation, John is picked up and carried forward in time. So to him these things shortly come to pass. Also, if you remember that a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. So looking at it from that perspective, 
In the eyes of God, only two days have passed since John wrote Revelation. Also, when a man lives during the tribulation and he picks up the book of Revelation, the term shortly come to pass will make this book even more alive to him. The Bible is written in such a way that when any man from any age picks it up, it is alive and real and relevant to him. Verse 3 says, For the time is at hand. And this goes along with shortly come to pass. If you are a Christian, then you get comfort from reading Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, which says, Must shortly come to pass. If you believe the Bible and you know God isn't a liar, then you can take comfort that everything is going to turn out just like God said it would. You can know for sure that the book of Revelation is true and everything in it is going to happen and you're not having faith for nothing. Okay, Revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So why did John get the revelation? He had it given to him to show servants things which must shortly come to pass. So revelation is going to be like a survival guide for people in the time of Jacob's trouble or what you know as the tribulation. They will know every move the Antichrist is going to make by reading the word of God. It is written to show people what they must do in the time of Jacob's trouble and how to endure until the end as it talks about in Matthew 24:13. Imagine a person in the time of Jacob's trouble picking up this book and reading the horrible things inside of it. He is definitely going to stay prayed up. Not only is he going to have the word of God to help him, but he will have signs following. The Jews require a sign, and that is why the apostles confirmed the word with signs following, as it says in Mark 16. The sign gifts come back in the time of Jacob's trouble when God continues dealing with the Jews again. And the one who reveals these things to us in the book of Revelation is an eyewitness. Revelation 1-2 says, Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. John can literally say he saw the rapture, the time of Jacob's trouble, the second advent, the millennial reign, the great white throne judgment, and so on and so forth. He can literally say he saw them with his own two eyes. Not only does God let you know these things must shortly come to pass, but he gives you an eyewitness to tell you about them. We can get practical application in our Christian life from the book of Revelation as well. Every Christian should bear record of the Word of God. You will get the chance in your Christian life to show unbelievers how the Bible is applicable to us. And the Bible interprets itself. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, you find out what that is in Revelation 19.10 where it says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. If you are a Christian, then you have the spirit of prophecy. When you tell someone they are going to hell because they aren't saved, you just prophesied. You told them their future. When you tell someone what is going to happen during the time of Jacob's trouble, then you just prophesied. You got the revelations of these things from the word of God. John also bears record of all the things that he saw. He saw these things with his own two eyes. He would be called a seer. Just like you will get a chance to tell someone how you have seen God work in your life. John is telling you what he saw in the book of Revelation. And Revelation 1-4 says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. The servants that John is sh uh, showing these things to are the seven churches. And notice he said, from him which is, and which was, and which is to come. This reveals to us that John believed in the resurrection. The phrase, which is, shows us that Jesus Christ is presently alive, unlike false gods who are dead. If you worship a dead god, then you'll end up dead. 
If you trust in a God who is alive forever, then you will live forever. In Revelation 1.5, Jesus is called the first begotten of the dead. And several characters in the Bible rose from the dead like Lazarus and Moses comes back from the dead in the future. But these men die again and they didn't rise from the dead by their own power. When Jesus rose from the dead, he did it by his own power and he won't die again. Acts 2.31 says, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So if you are a Bible believer, then you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you deny that, then you're not a Bible believer. Uh, Revelation 1.4 says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. So Jesus Christ is presently alive. He was walking around on earth before he died on the cross and he is coming again in the future. The last part of verse 4 says, And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And this reveals to us and reminds us that God is still on his throne. Kings throughout history have had the most beautiful thrones. But can you imagine what the throne of God Almighty looks like? Many people in high authority have a, a big group of people that surround them at all times. And that come along with them wherever they go. And God has seven spirits that are before his throne. Isaiah 11, 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. So the seven spirits are the Spirit of the Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. He also has cherubim and seraphim around his throne. Human kings may have carvings of cherubim and seraphim before their throne, but the Lord has the real thing. And they are also giving him praise. In Revelation 4, 8, it says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. I believe Revelation 4, 8 is describing the seraphim. But not only this, he has angels round about his throne. In Revelation 7, and verse 11, it says, And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God. God is so powerful and glorious that he has creatures as powerful as angels, and cherubim and seraphim, that worship him day and night. The Bible even says he created them. They are nothing compared to God. And way better than these, Jesus Christ is sitting with God. In Revelation 3.21 it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. What else is before his throne? It says in Revelation 4.6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne... How awesome would it be to walk on the sea of glass? I'd only want to do it in my glorified body. But you'll have the light of God shining on the glass. And that's what makes it look like gold streets. And what else does the Bible say about his throne? It talks about a river that runs out of it. In Revelation 22, 1 it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Psalms 103.9 says the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens. Imagine a throne built by the God who made the universe. Psalms 11.4 says the throne, his throne is in heaven. Psalms 45.6 says his throne is forever. Psalms 47.8 calls it the throne of his holiness. Psalms 89.14 says justice and judgment are the habitation of it. Psalms 93, 2, thy throne is established of old. Psalms 97, 2, righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Isaiah 14, 13 shows us that Satan covets his throne. And Daniel 7, 9 says his throne was like a fiery flame. 
Ephesians 1.20 says, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. If Jesus Christ is sitting with God the Father, then you are also spiritually sitting at the throne of God. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But not only this, John reveals to us that Jesus Christ is faithful. Revelation 1, 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, Titus 1, 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Jesus Christ wouldn't tell a lie, even if it would cost someone to be saved. We can know the book of Revelation is true because Jesus Christ won't tell a lie. But many people still don't believe this book, not because it is hard to understand, but because it is hard to believe. John reveals to us in verse 5 that Jesus Christ will, will reign in a literal, physical, visible kingdom on earth. Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. When Revelation 1.5 says, Prince of the kings of the earth, it is referring to a literal, visible, physical kingdom where Jesus Christ will reign over every king on the earth. Revelation 1 6 says he hath made us to be kings and priests. Christians who serve God now will have inheritance in the future millennial reign. 2 Timothy 2 12 says if we suffer we shall also reign with him. If we deny him he also will deny us. And then Revelation 1 6 and hath made us kings and priests. Unto, our, unto God and His Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jude one twenty five To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. 1 Peter 5.11 To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. One day Jesus Christ will have complete dominion over the earth. There won't be any abortion, sodomite marriages, corrupt government. Illuminati, there won't be any wicked music being played everywhere you go. There won't be all the crime and stuff you see now in the world. And Revelation 19.15 says he will rule with a rod of iron. And he will make us kings. This is part of God's benefit package. There are benefits to being saved and you get the best part of these benefits later. Psalms 103.2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Psalms 116.12, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? We are priests now, and we can offer up spiritual sacrifices, as it talks about in 1 Peter 1.25. Also notice Revelation 1.5 says, Washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus Christ purchased us with his own blood. He bought us, and that is redemption. We have been bought back. We were bought with a price, and we are not our own. So we should serve him. Notice the difference between church-age saints and Revelation 1.5, who are they themselves are washed in the blood, and the tribulation saints who wash their robes in the blood in Revelation 7, 13 through 14. So you have to rightly divide. But what else does John reveal to us in the first eight verses of Revelation? He reveals that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back at the second advent where every eye shall see him. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Notice it said, He cometh with clouds. Daniel 7, 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Joel 2, 2, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Zephaniah 1, 15 says, a day of clouds and thick darkness, referring to the day of the Lord. 
and then Matthew 24:30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Wouldn't it be something if a man in the time of Jacob's trouble was looking up at the sky trying to see things in the clouds and then he sees Jesus Christ coming back with ten thousands of his saints? And Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Notice that, and they also which pierced him. In Exodus 21 verses 5 through 6 if a servant didn't want to go out free from his master because he loved his wife he would have to get pierced exodus 21 5 says and if the servant shall plainly say i love my master my wife and my children i will not go out free then his master shall bring him unto the judges he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Just like Jesus Christ loved his bride, and was pierced for his bride, Jesus Christ was pierced in his side for his bride. Just like Adam was cut in Genesis 2.21 to get his bride, Eve. And Zechariah 12.10 says, They shall look on me whom they have pierced. Can you imagine when Jesus Christ was on earth and he read the Bible and knew those verses were about him? He knew that he was going to have to die for us. In John 19, 34, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. All of the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, it says in Revelation 1, 7. These people on the earth will hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks. Rich men have already created for themselves underground bunkers, luxu luxurious underground bunkers, but they're not going to be able to hide from God. And lastly, John reveals to us that Jesus Christ is the God-man, the I Am, the Almighty. Revelation 1.8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So in other words, Jesus Christ has been here from the beginning and even before the beginning and will be here at the end and even after that. John 1, 1 through 2 says, And the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus Christ was involved in the creation. Colossians 1, 16 through 17 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is Alpha and Omega, so he is from the beginning to the end. He is all the letters, so he is all the words. Psalms 138.2 says, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And Genesis 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then Genesis 1.3 says, And God said, And there's the word. You have God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the word Jesus Christ present in Genesis 1. Jesus Christ is the only God who has been here from the beginning and before the beginning and has always been here. And he is the only God who will still be here at the end and even after that. He is that which is, which was, and which is to come. He is right now a priest making intercession for us. He was a prophet before he died and he is coming back as a king. And never get those things confused. If you make him the king now, then you have him reigning now. And look around, he definitely isn't reigning yet. But this has been Revelation 1, verses 1 through 8 on Revelations while reading Revelation.